Hello again. <laughs> um, so as Mel mentioned last week, we started a series where we are walk- working through Valley Church's core values. Um, if you missed that sermon by Mel, I would highly recommend that you go back and listen to it because she gives an explanation of what core values actually are and how they're different to our statement of faith, which I'm not going to go into this morning. And last week, Mel spoke about our core value, kingdom mandate. And this morning, we're going to look at two, which are stewarding God's presence and God is good. So we're going to start with stewarding God's presence. So what we've said about this core value is we believe our ministry is first to seek and know God through the intimacy of a deepening personal relationship and engaging with him through his word, prayer, and worship. Thus, all other ministry is covered and emanates from his presence. So, God's desire from the very, very beginning has been to be with us, mankind. I'm not going to read it in Genesis, but you can go back and look. God creates the humans, and he puts them in a garden to tend the garden, and he walks with them in the wind of the day. That word, that Hebrew word is ruach, which is normally translated as cool of the day. And unfortunately, we know that Adam and Eve sin and are then banished from the garden and from God's presence. But from the moment that they are banished, God has already got a plan to restore humanity, to restore us so that we can be back in his presence and back in relationship with him. We know this from the the curse that is spoken to the serpent about the woman's offspring crushing the head of the serpent. Now, back then, Adam and Eve had no idea what God was talking about, and even the generations that came after that. We know, in hindsight, that that was a a reference to Jesus dying on the cross. But at the time, they didn't know what it meant. But it, it shows us that from the very beginning, God already had a plan to redeem humanity, to restore the relationship, and so that humans could be in his presence once again. It is all about God's presence. And then the rest of the Torah uh, is about the first five books of the Bible is about how God calls this nation to himself, the Israelites, and how he does this so that the Israelite nation can show the other nations around them how to be in a relationship with God and who this God is. The nation of Israel enters a covenant with God. And God gives them blueprints for the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is the place where God's presence will dwell amongst his people. And so during the book of Exodus, we read all these very interesting descriptions about the tabernacle. And they eventually set it up. And at the end of Exodus, God's presence comes, dwells in the tabernacle, but nobody can go in. Not even Moses, who meets with God face to face. And then Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, is all about the the laws that God gives, which are given so that they can be ritually and morally pure, so that they can be in relationship with God and be in his presence. It is all about God's presence. But we know that the Old Testament system wasn't ideal because they had to continually offer sacrifices to atone for their sins. But then Jesus comes, hooray! Um, And today we are so extremely privileged to be on this side of the cross where we don't have to continually offer sacrifices to atone for our sins. And because of Jesus, we can be in a relationship with God and we can be in God's presence. It is all about God's presence. From the beginning of the Bible, the whole Bible tells the story about how God created humanity to live in his presence and how after the fall, it was all about getting back into God's presence. And now, not only can we be in God's presence, but we actually have God's presence, God's spirit dwelling inside of us. And so this is why for us at Valley Church, it is all about God's presence, stewarding God's presence. Now, stewarding just means to take care of something. We might talk about carrying God's presence or being aware of God's presence, not grieving the Holy Spirit. And so at Valley Church, we make it a point that at every Sunday gathering, every corporate gathering, every prayer meeting, every leadership meeting, we invite God's presence in. 
and we give God permission to come and have his way. And this is why, on a very practical level, you may recognize that we have moments of quiet where the worship leader or whoever's up here at front will just be quiet as they sense God's spirit, God's presence, and what God is doing and what God has for us on a particular day. You might hear the person up front say, I think God is doing this this morning. I think God has this for us this morning. For example, peace. I think God has peace for us this morning. We believe that God's presence is here with us. Les has already alluded to that this morning. And so we want to make it a point of recognizing God's presence, His Spirit. And it's all about a living relationship. It's not a formula that we can follow. It's about what is He doing on this particular day, in this particular moment. And as a church, we are led by what God is doing and how He's leading even if it's not what the world around us thinks we should be focusing on. We're going to follow the direction that we believe the Holy Spirit is leading us in. Now, sometimes we can get a little bit nervous talking about the Holy Spirit, maybe because it's a little bit unknown or um, very much out of our control. Um, And I just want to say from personal experience that when I have been open to God's presence, His Spirit, He's so very gentle, um, and he, he loves to show us new things. And then when we're ready for the next new thing, He'll lead us there. In Psalm 73, verse 28, the psalmist writes, But I'll keep coming closer and closer to you, Lord Yahweh, for your name is good to me. I'll keep telling the world of your awesome works, my faithful and glorious God. And as a church, we want to be moving closer and closer to God. And so as a lifestyle here at Valley Church, we want to practice recognizing God's presence and ministering to others from that place of being in his presence. When we are aware of his presence, we can say what he's saying and we can do what he's calling us to do. Okay, so I like bullet points. So I've got a couple of bullet points for you that's basically like, okay, so stewarding God's presence, what does this core value mean? So the first one is we want to cultivate a lifestyle of recognizing God's presence. We want to recognize God every day throughout the day in everything that we do. So that's like in the typical Christian things, if I can put that in quotation marks, um, things like reading the Bible and prayer. But it's also recognizing God's presence while we work at our day job, while we are being creative, while we are in nature, or when we're with family and friends. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Let every activity of your lives and every word that comes from your lips be drenched with the beauty of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. So what does this mean Stewarding God's presence, the second bullet point is God has made us a dwelling place for his spirit. We believe at Valley Church that every believer has God's spirit living in them and therefore carries God's presence. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20, have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the spirit of holiness who lives in you? You don't belong to yourself any longer. For the gift from God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside your sanctuary. You were God's expensive purchase, paid for with tears of blood. So by all means then, use your body to bring glory to God. What does this core value mean to us at Valley Church? It means, I've said this already, as we draw near to God, he draws near to us. James 4 verse 8, move your heart closer and closer to God and he will come even closer to you. And so we believe here at Valley Church that as we draw closer to God, he will draw closer to us and we will experience more of him and that is what we are after. So we believe this for us as individuals in our everyday lives, as I've already mentioned, but we also believe that there's something that happens when we gather like this as a corporate body where God's spirit comes and we get to draw closer to him. And there's something about when we gather together as a corporate body that you probably won't experience when you are on your own. We believe in stewarding God's presence in your own life, but also as a corporate gathering. 
What does this core value mean? When we encounter God and His Holy Spirit, then we are moved to love people and tell them about Jesus. Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What does this core value mean? When we steward God's presence, we are filled with joy and peace, and we have courage to take risks to extend his kingdom. Mel spoke about this idea last week of the kingdom mandate, and um, you'll see that as we go through more of these core values, that they overlap in so many ways. I'm not going to read the verses they are in your, um, your worksheets. Um, so that's kind of what this core value means to us here at Valley Church. But now, we don't want you to misunderstand what we're not saying. There are two things that we're not saying here. We're not saying that we become so focused on His presence that we're disconnected from the rest of life. We don't just spend all our time in worship, prayer, and reading our Bible. Our mandate is to go and to be God's light and to share the gospel and to be an example of what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. What we're not saying is that we're so focused on God's presence that we're disconnected from the pain that our next-door neighbor is walking through. Um, we're not disconnected from the things that we read in the news. We're also not overwhelmed by the things we read in the news, but we're not disconnected from it. But what it means to be in God's presence and steward God's presence is that when we, when we see these things, we can ask God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do to declare into this situation? The second thing that we're not saying is that we become more self-focused, the point of being focused on God's presence is that we can be aware of what he's doing and how he's asking us to partner with him to do things for others. It's not just about ourselves. There's obviously a huge benefit from being in God's presence and experiencing his, God, his presence in our own lives, but it's not so that we can become more self-focused. It's actually so that we can become outward focused and go and do and be Jesus' hands and feet. John 17, verse 15 to eight and 18. Jesus says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, he's talking about his disciples, but that you protect them from the evil one. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We have been sent to carry God's presence, to steward his presence in the world. Okay, so that was a very quick rush through the first one. The second one is God is good. And what we have said here is God is who he says he is. Therefore, we trust him implicitly. This is the lens through which we view God and his word. So in Exodus 34, verse 6 to 7, God describes himself. And he describes himself as gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love and faithfulness. So this is what he says. The Lord, the Lord, this is God talking about himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is the way that God describes himself. This is a good God. He is gracious and compassionate, abounding in love and faithfulness and slow to anger. Now, we may struggle, if you're anything like me, you may struggle with this idea of God punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. But it's really important to note that there's two things here. Firstly, according to biblical scholars, it's understood, but it's actually not directly stated in our English translations, that God is saying that he is punishing the third and fourth generations of those who continue in the rebellion of their parents. So these aren't innocent people that he's talking about. It's also important to note that that line is supposed to be viewed in contrast to the line about God's love 
um, to thousands of generations. So on the one hand, you have his love, which extends to thousands of generations, but his punishment is to the third and fourth generation, which is way less than thousands. In other words, his love is so much greater than his punishment. And these verses in Exodus are the most referenced and requoted verses within the Bible. So other biblical scholars, I mean other bi biblical authors have requoted these verses over 20 times within the Bible. Sometimes not in its entirety, but just mentioning two or three of these characteristics. I'm not going to read it now, it is in your notes. You can see one example of this in Psalm 103. God is good. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God is good. And Jesus' life, ministry, and death shows us God's nature and that God is a good Father. In John 14, verse 6 to 7, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Why? Because they've seen Jesus and they know Jesus. So what, here come the bullet points for God is good. What does this mean? We believe that God is a good father and we can trust him regardless of our circumstances. Romans 8 verse 28. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. And in Matthew 10 we hear Jesus talking about how God notices when a sparrow falls to the ground, but we as humans are so much more valuable to God than the sparrows are. God is good. In Acts 16, it's in your notes, Paul and Silas are singing praises to God and speaking of his goodness while they are in prison. We believe that God is good and we can trust him no matter what situation we are in. What does this mean, God is good? We believe that enemies come to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to destroy the demonic works and give us abundant life. In John 10, verse 10 to 11, a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come, this is Jesus talking, I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. I am the good shepherd who lays down my life as a sacrifice for the sheep. 1 John 3 verse 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What does this core value mean? We believe that God's goodness is extravagant, and as we remember and retell what he has done through our testimonies, faith is created that he is able and eager to do it again. So this is why we share testimonies at Valley Church. We must tell of God's goodness. And there's no small testimony, again with the, the air quotes. If God has done something good in your life, no matter how big or small you may think it is, it is a big deal. There's lots of verses in your notes there, I'm not going to read any, but of times when God tells his people to tell of what he has done. Tell your children, tell your children, over and over again he instructs his people. So we believe that God is good and we must tell of what he's done. What does this core value mean? We believe that God is for us. Romans 8, 31 to 32. So what does this all mean? If God has determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as a sacrifice for all, 
he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. What do we mean by this core value? We believe that God's desire is for us to prosper in every area of our lives, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, vocationally. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And Je Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Jesus is our model. He healed all the sick that he encountered, and he never said that sickness was from God. Mel touched on this last week. And this is part of what we're saying with this core value, God is good. Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So as with the other core value, we don't want you to misunderstand. There are some things that we're not saying with this core value. We're not saying that as believers, we live a life that is free from trial, persecution, and trouble. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things, this is Jesus talking, so that in me you may find peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we're not saying that because God is good, we don't experience trouble. We're also not saying that we always get what we want. We don't always get what we want. And in God's goodness, he doesn't always answer our prayers the way we think he should or in the timing that we expect. No good parent gives their child everything they ever want. Isaiah 55 verse 8 to 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that is God is good. I have rushed through those two. <laughs> there was a lot to get through. And we want to do uh, an activation now as we finish up here. So an activation is just basically a way that you can take part actively in these core values. So I will do an activation for each one. Um, for God is good, we're going to repent of the times when we've allowed the lie that says God isn't good to take root in our hearts or our minds. Now, I believe that it's okay to grapple with God about these things. Like, you can't switch on the news and not sometimes wonder, like, how do I hold this intention, this truth that I believe that God is good, but also what I'm seeing happening in the world? And I don't think it's a problem to grapple with those things. But when you let that lie settle and take root, that's when we get into trouble. So we're going to repent of that lie. And then for stewarding God's presence, we want to, as an activation, just pray and ask God to come and fill us with his presence so that we can become more aware of him in our everyday lives as we partner with him in fulfilling our kingdom mandate. So we'll do them separately, and um, you can choose if you want to take part in one or both or none. It's really your choice. Uh, and I am going to ask you to stand. It's just a nice way for you to actively take part. So we'll start with God is good. If you want to take part in the God is good activation, you can stand. And I'm going to say some things, and then you can repeat after me. We'll go slowly through it. All right, so we say, God, we repent of any time that we have allowed the lie God isn't good to settle in our hearts and minds. Please forgive us. Now, if you can think of a very specific situation where you've attached the thought God isn't good to something, then just take a moment quietly to just repent very specifically into that. Okay, and you can say after me again, God, we declare the truth that you are good. Everything you do is good. 
and for my good. Amen. Okay, so that was God is good. We're going to do stewarding the presence. So if you want to take part in that, you can remain standing. And again, you can say after me, God, thank you for your constant presence with us. Thank you for making your home inside of me. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and have your way. Fill me up. Make me more aware of your presence and your voice. I want to partner with you each day and bring heaven to earth. Let me pray with us. You can stay standing. God, thank you for these two truths, that you are good and that we have your presence dwelling inside of us. And as we go into this week, Holy Spirit, will you keep speaking to us about the three core values that we've looked at so far? Open our hearts and our eyes to see things with your perspective. We say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Have your way. We want to partner with you. We love you, Jesus, and we worship you and honor you. Amen.